Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. So today I'll be talking about a project that we are working with uh, OpenSSF and specifically the Alpha Omega uh, project inside OpenSSF. And I'll be talking about uh, what we are doing there, what are the uh, outcomes of, of that particular project, and specifically the insights that's going to come out of that project, we, which will guide us about how we can, how the security practitioners can serve open source maintainers without annoying them. So a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm uh, Unawar Hafiz. I'm the CEO of uh, a Bay Area-based static analysis tool company called Open Refactory. Uh, uh, I have been working on automatic bug detection and fixing for the past 17 years. Uh, and uh, so my PhD work at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, it was considered one of the pioneering works on um, automatic bug fixing. It was asking the question, why stop at detecting bugs only? Why can't we have tools that not only can detect bugs, but also can fix them automatically? Um, I've worked in the academia. Uh, I worked in the industry at the top bug detection company. Um, I, uh, and so right now uh, we are working with uh, Open Refactory, which is our startup. The origin of that work came from, uh, from my uh, academic research and everything, and we're, uh, we're continuing that. Uh, so this work is done by the Open Refactory security team, and it, it has been, as I mentioned, it has been supported by an Alpha Award from uh, Alpha Omega Project, and uh, it's associated with the OpenSSF. So thanks a lot for them uh, for supporting the work. So obviously I don't need to show this slide, but it's just a preamble. Uh, everybody knows why we are here. Under the hood of all the software that we use, write, ev there's all open source. And uh, so some recent statistics on that. So 70 to 90% of code in web and cloud applications come from open source software. 91% um, of commercial applications contain outdated and abandoned open source components. That's the problem. Uh, that's what the supply chain security conference is about. So there are two approaches uh, that, uh, that we'll talk about and we will be guiding you on specifically what uh, we are doing and how is it uh, overall uh, connected with the supply chain security conference uh, theme. But everybody knows about the security uh, failure and there's a lot of failure out there. It's increasing, it's costly. Uh, so let's go to the meat of it. The work uh, that's, f uh, that's going on about securing open source software, you can, uh, and, and you can look at it from two perspectives. One is uh, to fix the software itself. Uh, look at the root cause, the, it's the software that is vulnerable, how can we uh, fix and work, uh, fix the bugs in the software, work with the maintainer so that those vulnerabilities or bugs in the software are not there in the first place. And then there's the second approach which is you are as, uh, as, the, uh, as the downstream uh, consumers of the projects, you're consuming a lot of, uh, lot of these uh, these open source applications and how can you like keep updated about the supply chain and, and make sure that you're always using the secure component and, and so on. So specifically this work, this is focusing on approach one, which is finding the root cause or fighting the root cause, fix the vulnerabilities, add the soft vulnerabilities and bugs in the software itself. But there's so many software out there. How do you do that? So. What we are doing is we have an ambitious project. We are trying to fix bugs at scale. So this is basically the, sta the mission statement for us. So Open Refactory, we analyze source code of the top 10,000 Java, Python, and Go projects. Uh, and we use our intelligent code repair or ICR tool, which is our proprietary tool. And then we also use other static analysis tools that are available. Um, and we report bugs many different kinds of bugs uh, to the maintainers and work with them to fix the bugs. That's essentially what we're doing. Pretty simple mission statement. 
So there are two approaches. When we are talking about many softwares and how do we work with the maintainers, there are, again, two different paths that you can take. One is you can do a depth-first approach. So you detect, a fi detect and fix a single vulnerability across all the projects that can harbor that particular vulnerability. And there are values because uh, we have heard talks yesterday and, uh, and today uh, earlier as well that there are many, uh, many open source vulnerabilities that are identified, or, or software vulnerabilities in, in general, they are identified, fixed, but not adopted by all the projects because there's forks and stuff. It's just hard to keep up uh, on all of them. So the, the, the depth first approach, it focuses on detecting and fixing that single vulnerability across all projects to get rid of that particular vulnerability once and for all. The second approach is the more comprehensive approach, which is look at different kinds of bugs that can happen in these different projects um, and how do you fix that. So this particular work again, now we are following approach two, uh, which is looking into different kinds of bugs, different kinds of projects, and how do we fix those bugs, uh, uh, bugs in the software. So, uh, but let's talk about the depth first approach a little bit. So there are two prior uh, works that are, have, have like grown into prominence and then people have, uh, have tried that. Uh, so one was done by my friend, my good friend, Jonathan Lechu. Uh, so he did some work on doing these campaigns on, and that, that's kind of the, uh, so he kind of I invented that idea uh, where you look into some kind of bugs and then uh, look into all the projects that have, have that bug. So look into, a, uh, do a GitHub search and find all of, uh, all of the things out there then create a pull request across the board uh, to all of those projects and see uh, you, if you can fix that, that problem. So theoretically, that, that looks very good. Recently, in 2022, uh, researchers from Trellix, it's a company, they actually reported over 61,000 patches, uh, GitHub patches, in one go uh, to fix a vulnerability that has been there for 15 years. It's a Python. Uh, tar file vulnerability of using a method in an improper manner, but it has been it has been fixed. But it has been out there, at least in 61,000 different projects, um, and and so how can you fix? Uh, and, and so so they generated uh, generated pull request in order to uh, attempt to fix all of them. So that all sounds good, but then bugs are nuanced. And uh, so that's definitely one way of targeting that. But if you want to generate a single fix for all the bugs, you will run into two problems. One is that you will limit yourself to shallow bugs only because the more difficult a bug gets, it's hard to produce a fix that will apply to all of these projects. Um, so you will, add, uh, so in, in our, so this is Jonathan Lechu's zip slip bug fix campaign, uh, for example. And uh, if you see here, there's uh, 101 open uh, a pull request for something that was submitted two years ago. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's about 91 that has been closed, but it, con it also contains the project data. So it's not like there's all 91 of them. Uh, but so, so the point is there's still, like you, you have generated a pull request. How many of those pull requests are accepted? How can you do that? One of the many different problems that occurred in this one and also the Trellix uh, approach was that you created uh, fixes that would break the product itself. And that would annoy the maintainers a whole, a whole lot and, and that's, uh, that's just creating a lot of chaos. So that, that's the second point. So uh, if you don't limit yourself to shallow bugs, try to do something aggressive, then you overreach and you make a lot of mistakes uh, in detecting the bugs, in identifying whether it's a true positive, in creating a fix that is also correct. That's, there's a lot of work. And uh, unfortunately, like doing that in a totally automated manner is not there yet. Uh, so there is a term that has been in, in the parlance for some time. It's called drive-by pull requests. So as security practitioners, drive-by pull request means that uh, you are not a maintainer of an open source project. 
you are a security practitioner who somehow have found a bug and you just came to that project, reported that bug, you moved on. Probably Linux this morning was mentioning about 50% of Linux pull, uh, pull requests in the Linux kernel were just by, a uh, by some contributor who just created that one fix and moved on. And uh, so, so it has been happening for ages. But the drive-by pull requests are specifically annoying for the maintainers because they're already under a lot of pressure of doing stuff, uh, doing a lot of stuff. And now uh, there's the security practitioners who have come up with this uh, pull request and some of them may work, some of them may don't. Uh, so it creates a lot of annoyance uh, in, the, in the community of the maintainers. So for example, like one of the problems is like, so this is, these are also coming from that uh, the first campaign of that zip slip campaign that I was mentioning, uh, uh, that uh, this is only in the test code, so it's not, it doesn't matter, like don't bother me with this, and so on. Uh, then there's uh, something about uh, that, uh, that, the, that this is probably coming from a bot, and I don't like to get things from a bot, so if you, s if you act like a bot, if you sound like a bot, don't come to me. That's uh, that's a common uh, concern that's, that's provided. And actually, the, the pull request uh, was filed under a different name. If you go back, uh, these were the, the generic name that was added, but then the maintainers themselves actually uh, <laughs> changed the pull request name to this. So you see, like, there's a lot of annoyance that's happening. So what we have done, um, and so, uh, so before the start of this particular project, we also did our own proof of concept. And we uh, looked into a small number of projects, about 50 something projects, we submitted bugs. We were doing it in a semi-automated manner where we were uh, using the tools, then we manually triaged, and we used an automated way of, of, uh, uh, of uh, submitting the vulnerabilities, but they were actually uh, driven or triggered by, by somebody, hu human being. And so we also got similar uh, love, hate, however you look at it, that kind of responses from those. So from that we did something called a firehose style interview, uh, basically asking the maintainers who were not happy uh, with those things and go to them and ask them, what would make you happy? What is the problem? We explained the context to them um, and so on. How can we work with them better so that they, they would be more appreciative and accept, uh, accepting our work more. Uh, so these are the four key things that came out from that uh, conversations. So first of all, the, sh uh, the shallow bugs, uh, that's, if, if it's a very simple bug that doesn't bother me, uh, there's many other important stuff to do, don't do those kind of bugs. Uh, there's also suggested fixes that break code or have other bugs in them, so do, uh, that, that's also something that's very problematic. Uh, there's also the, the reporter, because it's a drive-by PR, uh, at that point the reporter is, not abs uh, is just absent and therefore they don't want to follow the process, they want to follow the norms of the project, and if each project has their own norms, it's very nuanced. And uh, so the reporter refuses and, and that's, that's not good. Uh, then, and the final one is the reporter appears to be a bot. That's, that's the single most triggering uh, response that we have got. It, it was also shown in our proof of concept and also proof of concept study and also the previous uh, campaigns that were there. So then we basically planned our approach. How do we do that? And so uh, our approach is focusing on addressing the four issues that we identified. So, what we are doing is we are triaging bug reports manually uh, from the intelligent code repair and other static analysis tools that on and only concentrate on high and medium severity bugs. So ignore all the low, low level severity bugs that are provided by the tools. People don't care about them anymore uh, at all. So don't bother uh, with them. Only focus on those. Uh, adopt a semi-automated approach uh, there's some automation that would help, but that would be about creating the pull requests or uh, in, a, in a programmatic manner. Uh, so it's not about doing anything uh, 
uh, robotic in the sense of like there's a bug reported, we just automatically go and, and uh, uh, reported by the tool, we just go and automatically report it to the maintainers. We don't do that. Uh, there's some human who's driving the bug submission process, but the bug submission takes a lot of time. So there's some value in creating a triage portal uh, that's going to allow you to manage all the so many bugs that you are receiving by, by these tools. Um, and then the bug reporting is, is done following the project uh, requirements. Uh, the team members, the security team members, they work with the maintainers to follow the norms, which is very important in, in, in like making less friction in this relationship. And then bugs are triaged for correctness before being reported, and sometimes proof of concept exploit code is created to demonstrate the impact uh, of the bug and so on. And uh, most importantly, bugs are reported from handles that belong to human beings. Uh, so that it doesn't support, uh, it doesn't look like a bot. And the, and the context is explained, as in like, okay, we are doing this uh, because of, of this overall project that we're doing. The context is very, very important uh, so that it's clear to the maintainers that this is not just a drive-by PR campaign. But the fundamental problem is still there, how to scale for so many projects that are out there. We mentioned that we are looking for top 10,000 Java, Python, and Go projects. That's 30,000 projects in this particular uh, work that we are doing. If you think that there's about, uh, I don't know, like a 1,000 bugs that are being reported by your tool, and many of the static analysis tools out there, they report a ton of bugs. Many of them are actually false positive and so on. If you do that, we are looking at about 30 million uh, bugs. Who's going to triage that? Or how, how can we scale to that particular level? So that's where uh, our tool ICR, it comes of help. Um, and so ICR or intelligent code repair, we find bugs that other tools miss. And we do, the, do that with dramatically low false positive. Uh, so here's some, some data compared to some other uh, tools that are out there. So the first one is a project from Red Hat. It's called Epicurio Registry. This is a Java project, about 150,000 lines of code. Uh, so ICR found about 100 something bugs in that. Uh, there's uh, nine, uh, there's about uh, like 10 false positive, but then most of the bugs are true positive. If you look, if you whittle it down to only the high and medium severity bugs, you'll probably look at about 10 bugs or something like that. So it's it's manageable. Uh, compared to that, if you run Sonar Cloud, it identifies about 1,200. Uh, even under high and uh, high severity bugs, it will still categorize about uh, like three, 400 of them, but then Many of them will be false positive when you look at that. So that will, uh, that's, that's where the problem is. So, so that's where the precision of ICR helps. This is another project. These are bugs found in Django. Uh, uh, this is a Python project, obviously. Um, and so we are compared with ICR and Bandit. Here, Bandit, the, the open source tool, it actually uh, finds, uh, it doesn't find enough in this particular case. So, so you have to cater for both of them. You have to find bugs that other tools miss and find critical bugs in the first place. But at the same time, you need to do it with very low false positive. Um, so we have to focus on bugs that man, uh, matter. So uh, we only file if the bug is critical. Uh, and if we can avert that, uh, then there's a major win. So we look into, obviously, the, the more Im important bug categories. Uh, like the injection attacks, the high level, uh, the, the more important uh, security bugs are mostly the inject uh, related about, about the injection attacks and the weak cryptography and sensitive data leakage, th that kind of, uh, yeah, those kind of areas. Uh, we also look into reliability issues like null difference and concurrency issue, uh, issues um, in code and, and so on and, and focus on those. Uh, so for example, here's a cross-site scripting that was averted in uh, one of the Red Hat projects. In this particular case, we reported the bug privately through emails because that's what the, the norm was in that particular case. And so here, the, uh, there was a, a response that was coming from a user input, and it was, uh, it was just uh, coming, uh, getting to a reflected process scripting attack. So you just made the response different. We didn't create that fix. We just worked with the maintainers. We reported to them privately. And then the maintainers came up with the fix themselves. 
Here's another bug uh, that we reported in the, uh, and it's still actually open. This is a data race in the Kubernetes code. Um, and uh, so again, we did not create a fix in this particular case. This is a very complex bug. But we have identified the bug anyway, reported it. It's right now still open and, and is being fixed at this particular point. Here's another one. This is an improper method call. Uh, this has already been merged. And so this is uh, you, uh, about using make temp, which is an unsafe function, and use a safe or alternative for, uh, for that. So obviously, in that particular case, we created a pull request because the fix was pretty easy. It was also created by ICR in this particular case. And uh, so we reported that it got merged pretty fast response in this particular case. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, a particular security issue that was averted. So one of the things that, we, uh, that was coming up in this case was following the process. Different uh, projects come up with, or they have their own way of uh, reporting vulnerabilities. And so how do we also report these vulnerabilities in a responsible manner? So this is a draft proposal, and obviously this is not consumed. Uh, so I, I have a uh, like in the uh, final slide, which you have access to. Uh, there is a reference, so you'll get uh, basically the the Git repo where which contains this and, and so on. But obviously I did not mean uh, mean for this to be read. And so this is a draft proposal that looks into different ways of uh, of uh, how a vulnerability can be reported and which one to, or which path to take in, in under what, what circumstances. And so there are, there, here are some of them enumerated, the different ways. So there's the GitHub private vulnerability reporting, which is something that, is, uh, had, uh, that was recently introduced by GitHub and now being heavily promoted. Uh, you can also do pull requests, but then that's uh, disclosing openly, so that's not necessarily uh, a good thing. There's, you can also do issue creation, you can do GitHub advisory. You can email to maintainer. Some, uh, some projects have just protocol to, to do that. Then some others use separate portals to manage the bugs and so on. But the point is you work with the maintainers. That's, that's the key thing uh, in order to uh, do this stuff. So here's our semi-automated triage portal that we uh, maintained. So the part that we automated was, for example, the boring part of creating a pull request. So uh, you can just like change the commit message. You can just change change the body. You just hit submit all the like minor steps that you need to provide in order to do the pull request. Those have been automated. So that that uh, expedites our work a little bit. But specifically, we just follow a subset of the protocol, the parts that can be easily automated, and our triage portal right now automates uh, those aspects for sending, uh, sending the bugs. Again, I don't want to read that. So the communication is the key. Uh, you need to convince. You can, uh, you can not only report bugs, but you have to convince the, uh, the people in order to fix the bugs. So for example, here's a communication chain. So we identified an improper method call. Uh, so there's a not implemented error in Python, which was done, uh, which is not the right way of doing things. So we reported that, and we got the regular response. Is it an AI-generated bug or not? So, uh, so then we explained uh, our context to them again, even though it was already explained there, but we uh, created another explanation. Uh, then they were happy about it, and uh, they did fine. So we worked with them. The original fix that we supported or uh, we created, they say that there were some changes that they needed to uh, was needed to be made uh, in that because they were following some other norms in in their particular project. So we did did that work with them, and eventually it got marked. So that's the process. Each bug has its own story. And uh, you need to follow that process in order to do that. It's a tedious manual, uh, manual and semi-automated work, but then you are doing a lot of good by averting these things in the first place. Um, sometimes you do explicit demonstration. So here's a very simple bug. I did not have an explanation uh, of like the critical exploit. So there are many bugs that we are reporting through private channels, the cross-site scriptings and the others and, and those, the, imp the more important ones. So I have a uh, like short POC of a very simple problem here. Here we reported a bug where there's a Python import statement, but that import statement Instead of using a, a, a so an export statement, but instead of using a a, a string there, it was uh, like exporting that library by providing the function itself, which would create a crash. So it's very easy to demonstrate. So we just like created a small 
This is not an exploit code by any means. It's just like a three-line demonstration of what's going to happen. But it just like makes the problem vivid uh, to, the, uh, to the maintainer. And they just uh, created, uh, accepted our fix and, and moved on. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in those, uh, those cases. Well, there are many more critical examples that I could show, but I'm not showing that because of privacy reasons. These are uh, like we have created exploits for deserialization, uh, cross-site scripting, uh, uh, cross-site request forgery, uh, log injection, et cetera, and have shared with the maintainers, and, and they have then worked with them to, to get those bugs fixed. So what's the current status of work? So uh, the results are of all the scans that we are doing, they are publicly available. So we are using a Google Sheet. Uh, so there, here's the, the, uh, the link of that particular, uh, particular uh, Google Sheet uh, that, uh, that's there. But here's basically a general idea of the report. So what are the key metrics that we are following? So the number of projects scanned that we are doing, uh, the, how many projects that we have scanned do not have a bug? Uh, how many bugs that we, in general, report? Uh, what are the security and reliability bugs, which are of more prominence that we are reporting? Uh, there's also, in how many cases were we able to automatically create a fix? Um, how many of the bugs were actually accepted? Um, and how many of the bugs were the security and reliability bugs that were accepted. So these are the key metrics that we are following in this particular project. So in the last four months of work that we have, uh, we have just started, uh, we have looked into over 1,000 uh, repositories. About 900 of them, we didn't find anything. So at least they are scrubbed and they're clean. That's also a very important uh, message uh, if you are consuming the, those data. Uh, you can just come to this portal. That's the, basically the use case that we're uh, looking at, that you'll just come to this portal, look at this data, and uh, not a portal. Uh, let's, let's not over uh, complicate. It's just a Google sheet. It's just a Google sheet. You just come here and see, has it been scanned? Has it been cleared? OK, I, I'm, I, I can go ahead and use that. Um, so the, we identified and reported about 168 bugs in the past four months. About 80 of them are security bugs. Uh, about 140 out of those 168, we were also synthesizing a fix. So that expedited the process. The fixes were generated by our tool. Uh, there were, in 22 cases, where we were creating exploits that uh, we mentioned uh, to make the uh, communication better, and, and therefore that, that helped in adopting. Uh, about 45% of the bugs that we reported were merged. About 30% of the security bugs uh, that we have reported are March. Many others, the security bugs typically take a longer time to fix. So it's just a rolling thing uh, that we are doing. Uh, it's not that they have been rejected. Uh, there's only nine bugs uh, that we have reported, about 5% that have not been accepted. That's fine. Uh, the attack surface, so we reported a log injection, but the attack surface is not there. Uh, we don't, uh, or some, uh, like in another case, uh, like uh, so something that was done on code that is, uh, and that part of the code is not active anymore. These are stuff that, un uh, like, we cannot understand, like, the, uh, from, from somebody who's outside the project. So that's where we communicate with them um, and figure out, like, what's the best course of action to take, and we just move on. Uh, so that's that. So, what's the key takeaways of this? So, the open source maintainers, they need a lot of help from security practitioners. But uh, the security practitioners should communicate with the maintainers in a meaningful way. Um, and doing it uh, and not following up with them, the communication is the key. That's, that's the most important thing that we have found out. Um, and Open Refactory's work that we have done, we have demonstrated a model of en engagement that shows promise. I, I wouldn't say that this is the way that everybody should take, but at least it's promising 50% of the bugs that we are reporting gets accepted, so that's, that's pretty good. And again, the results are available here. Um, so I again thank our sponsors, Alpha Omega and OpenSSF, for supporting this work, and I'll be happy to take questions from you. Thank you. Yes, Kate. So right now, we uh, are not looking into C. We started with Java, Python, and Go. We are obviously 
uh, want to increase it to specifically C and J C, C++ and JavaScript so that we covered the most important languages, the top five languages, but that's not the scope of the project yet. Definitely that's something where we're going, yes. So that's a good question. So the question was, and I should have uh, repeated the previous question, sorry about that. The previous question was about whether we are supporting C, and I answered that. This is about false positive in the security tools. Existing state of static analysis tools are frankly not great. Uh, these tools, they're known to operate at 70 to 90% false positive rate. So every 10 bugs that are identified by the tools, nine of them are actually false positive. So there's a lot to be done in the static analysis tool uh, landscape in the first place. And so I'd be happy to talk about that because that's, that's been my, something that I've been working on, very passionate about. But it's, it's just that the existing tools, they, so for example, many of the bugs they will find in test code. And it's very easy to filter test code and not report bugs there. But if you find 100 bugs out of those 1,200 that was identified by some tool, it's just a waste of time. And how easy is it for a tool to filter those out, except they don't? That's, it's just how the state of the art is at this point. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the question is, and correct me if I'm uh, not re uh, uh, phrasing it correctly, but wh what can we do so that projects can also, the maintainers can also buy in to this kind of reporting and they consume this? That's definitely the vision where we want to be. We are not there yet, uh, but uh, maybe in the next one year or two years, uh, when you get, the, the whole point is about the trust issue. How can we create trust so that the, the pull requests that are being generated is just not b done by a company PR. Uh, it's not just done by a drive-by and, and not somebody who cares. Uh, so that empathy that needs to be, in the end security is a human problem and this is just working on that. Obviously as the tools become more mature and some trust is instilled on the effort, we expect to have a better future where people can actually automatically subscribe to this stuff, but we are not there yet uh, at this point. Yes, Adam. So I know uh, a lot of this, like, there's four projects listed on GitHub. A lot of projects can do the Tendabot uh, on their projects. Is this analysis either between projects that have the Tendabot enabled or able to like detect that, or is like an open the Tendabot pull request for some of these? So the question was the uh, how do we find the scope of the projects and where we filtering based on other results on supply chain like Dependabot already. Uh, so right now the w we are using the uh, there is a list that's created by OpenSSF of the top top ten thousand GitHub projects on all the different languages. Our good friend Caleb Brown from Google is, uh, is working on that. Uh, that, that uh, but, but that is not dynamic yet, so we are working on a snapshot of time, in time, so uh, 10,000 projects, top, uh, top 10,000 projects that were identified at a certain point, we just use that as the starting point of doing the scan. 
In each of the bugs that we identify, we do a quick scan. Obviously, it could be improved of whether something similar, like when we are doing a cross-site scripting reporting, we just look for the uh, cross-site scripting in open pull requests, et cetera, to see whether there's a, there's a uh, overlap or something. But in many cases, we are actually finding new bugs, which is also very interesting. Uh, so not found by any other tools. Uh, so that's so right now we don't. The short answer is we don't use Dependabot or any uh, tools or data yet. But that could be something that could be used to improve uh, improve the bug reporting. Yes. So uh, it's more a comment, but let me just rephrase that comment. I think mo the, the, the point that is coming out is, can we use the depth first approach that, uh, that I was mentioning for some of the bugs uh, and, and uh, use bulk PRs in that particular case to fix them? Yes, we, we, we can. Uh, again, I mentioned that my uh, Jonathan Leichu, who did the initial work, is a very good friend of mine. Um, and uh, so we uh, have been working hand in hand on, on, on this particular uh, uh, issues. But so definitely that, that can be done. Uh, the other point that I was receiving was about, uh, sorry, there was something there that, uh, that has escaped. But, but yeah, we can definitely have a conversation uh, after this uh, regarding, uh, regarding this. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for attending this talk. Thank you.